In chapter 14, we are going to be taking a look at two somewhat separate ideas. One is going to be allergy, and then the other idea is how the immune system responds to parasites. But what you'll find is that it makes total sense to combine these two ideas into one chapter because the mechanism is largely the same and how the body responds to parasites, we see the exact same thing happen with allergy. And so that's why it is combined together in chapter 14. So a little bit of an introduction. Humans come into contact with all kinds of things that are non-self. And these macromolecules are foreign to us, sure, but they really don't cause any threat to life, right? Um, and many of these, we can call them antigens. Um, they come from the plants and the animals in the environments in which we live, in the, the food that we eat and the the you know, areas we inhabit, these, these antigens are always there. They're always present and we work there, we play there, and we're constantly being bombarded by these different types of antigens. And most of the time, it doesn't matter. For most people and in most situations, contact with these macromolecules, although are non-self in nature, don't pose a threat, and so there's not going to be any type of immune response to them. It's not going to cause inflammation. It's not going to drive an adaptive immune response in most situations. But in some circumstances, sometimes these harmless antigens, these harmless molecules, can actually stimulate an immune response. And so there's a primary immune response that is generated. And because of that, memory is generated against these antigens that are really no threat. And so anytime then the body is exposed to these antigens that are non-threatening, there is a response, a memory response. It's a secondary immune response. And we know that what we learned with the secondary immune response is that it's fast, it's good, it's strong, and it will attack these antigens and um, try to eliminate them from the body. Even though it doesn't matter if they're in the body, these are unnecessary reactions. They're overreactions of the immune system. And because of that, we call them hypersensitivities. Um, we can also call them allergic reactions. Both of those two things mean the same thing, a hypersensitivity or an allergic reaction. The environmental antigens that cause an allergy or a hypersensitivity, we call these allergens. We don't use the term antigen. Antigen is kind of the big umbrella term, but allergen is the more specific term for these macromolecules that really don't pose a threat. And any allergens that introduce or induce a state of hypersensitivity then, um, we call that an allergy. So that state of hypersensitivity is an allergy. Um, another word you'll often see mentioned along with allergy or hypersensitivity is adipy. Adipy is the um, combination of adding an A in front of topi, and topi would be like place. And if you put an A in front of it, it negates. And so um, adipy is the Greek way of saying out of place or maybe peculiar, it's not normal, it's not where it should be. And so an atopic individual is somebody that has atopy, and that means that they are predisposed to allergy. And so atopic individuals then, um, we see them make up about 40% of Europeans, North Americans, uh, or North Americans of European descent. descent. And so um, it is a, uh, you know, not a worldwide population. We'll discuss that a little bit later. But these individuals are called atopic, meaning they are predisposed to allergy. And we do have in certain parts of the world an endemic of allergy. And this becomes um, where we see allergies becoming more and more prevalent in a population 
uh, as time goes on. And so there's more people that are allergic to things in the present population than there were in the previous generation. Okay, I wanna spend the next few slides talking about the different ways we classify hypersensitivities to kind of set a baseline for our discussion on allergy. And we can break down hypersensitivity reactions into four different types. And the way we break them down is um, the mechanism of how allergy comes about or how the response um, presents itself and the mechanism behind how that occurs. And um, all hypersensitivity reactions are derived from the secondary immune response. So it's not the innate, not the innate response, but rather the adaptive immune response. And we'll look at how these four different ways um, are, are described or characterized in the next few slides. So starting with a type one hypersensitivity. A type one hypersensitivity is triggered when there is an interaction of an allergen with an IgE that is specific for that antigen. And that IgE is going to be bound to the surface of either a mast cell, an eosinophil, or a basophil. IgEs we'll look at um, in the next lecture here a little bit more. But recall that IgE antibodies, once they're made by a plasma cell, they quickly get absorbed onto the surface of one of those three cells um, because of the epsilon receptors that they have. So then IgE are bound to these cells. And when there isn't in interaction between specific antigen and that receptor, the variable region of the IgE, that will cause cross-linkage to occur, which sends signals down to the basophils, mast cells, or eosinophils to go through the degranulation process. When cells degranulate, then they're going to release their granules that contain a lot of inflammatory mediators. Uh, and these inflammatory mediators are going to cause a wide range of physiological effects. Um, we'll see that a lot of times these allergens are inhaled. So a type one hypersensitivity um, is pretty fast. We call it an immediate hypersensitivity because this reaction occurs as soon as those IgEs are engaged with antigen. Um, and the physiological effects often, uh, because it is a respiratory most often um, mechanism, uh, we're going to see runny nose, we're going to see trouble breathing, and potentially it could lead to a process of asphyxiation if breathing is shut down or blocked. So type one hypersensitivity, also known as an immediate hypersensitivity uh, because it happens as soon as exposure um, typically breathed in. Okay, a type two hypersensitivity is uh, activated with antibody, just like we saw with type one um, IgE involved, but with type two, it's IgG. It's most commonly caused, or it's caused by an IgG uh, that recognizes an altered self protein. This can come about by maybe somebody takes a medication and that medication, and that's what's shown in this diagram here. So we have this medication, in this case, it's penicillin, comes in and attaches. These are, these are self proteins. And normally they would be ignored by the immune response. But when the medication comes in and attaches to that self protein, it alters it. It makes it look different to the immune system. And if there is an antibody, IgG, that recognizes that as its specific antigen, that will cause the uh, activation then of the immune system. So it is when a chemical somehow modifies the structure of a self protein, and now those self proteins are perceived as non-self. 
when the um, specific, when that antibody binds its specific antigen, then that's going to cause this modified human cell. So the cell that has this modified self protein to become subject to removal. And that removal can happen by way of complement. Um, remember, IgG can um, activate complement. There can be complement deposition. It can also be an obstinate on its own. And so complement activation can occur and remove a cell um, by phagocytosis or phagocytosis, um, recognizing the FC portion as an opsonin can, can occur too. Regardless, it will lead to damage or killing of the self cell, which then um, will damage the tissue. Any, any of those cells that are removed, if it happens in bulk, the tissue can be largely damaged by those macrophages coming in um, and clearing them out. So a type two hypersensitivity is mediated by IgG molecules. Type three hypersensitivity are also antibody mediated, but instead of being attached to a um, self protein, rather we're going to see soluble antigen being recognized as a foreign antigen and IgG attaching to it and causing an immune complex to be formed. And those immune complexes can then be deposited in along the epithelial lining of the blood vessels. Um, this can also happen in the lung tissue. You can see this happen in the, the kidney tissue. Uh, and these um, immune complexes can then destroy that tissue. It damages it, it impairs the function. So you end up with trouble breathing, you can have kidney problems. Um, but this is uh, another term for this is called serum sickness. And you'll often hear about serum sickness being associated with if somebody gets an immunotherapy, let's say they get a, some sort of um, antibody that is infused into them as a therapy. And then that therapy actually becomes the antigen that mount that the immune resistance, uh, the immune system attacks. And so this is always a potential side effect when immunotherapies are given. And this is also the impetus as to why more immunotherapies are going towards the fully humanized monoclonal antibody or at minimum a chimeric, but all pretty much we're moving towards a um, fully humanized therapy. Okay, and the fourth type of hypersensitivity is going to be T cell mediated. Okay, it is a reaction where T cells are going to be driving the immune response. And these are going to most of the time be T helper one. T cells it can also be CD8 positive T cells as well. So these T, remember T helper one, we talked about how when you hear T helper one, you should really think inflammation. You should think an inflammatory response because those are the cytokines that T helper one cells drive. And so when a T helper one cell is engaged and is polarized, or when a T cell is engaged and is polarized towards a T helper one response, you're going to see more inflammation. And when we look at the skin, if that inflammation occurs, that's going to result in red, itchy, blistering skin. And, um, um, this can be known as a contact hypersensitivity. So we, we know type four as either being called a contact hypersensitivity or can also be called a delayed type hypersensitivity too. So those two names are often interchangeable with type four hypersensitivity. We see this happen when things come into contact with the skin. So for example, a nickel allergy, where some people can't wear jewelry that contain nickel, that contains nickel because of the irritation of the nickel um, atoms on the skin that looks like a, an allergen. 
Um, it's picked up by dendritic cells, presented to T cells. T cells then will proliferate into effector T cells, polarizing towards a type one um, reaction. That releases inflammation, you get itchy, you get redness at the contact point of that nickel. Um, we can also see this with uh, poison ivy. And in the case of poison ivy, it's the proteins that that poison ivy plant produces are recognized as non-self and CD8 positive T cells are activated. The CD8 positive T cells are going to be recognizing these poison ivy peptides on the surface of MHC class one, and they're going to be targeting the cells that are presenting these peptides. Destruction of those cells occur, but it doesn't happen immediately. It takes some time. And because of that, we see a delayed response. It could be a few hours. Um, it could be a day or so even after. Depends on how long it takes to get enough of these T cells activated. But a type four hypersensitivity is driven by T cell mediated, and it's going to be either T helper one response or a CD8 positive T cell response. Those are the four hypersensitivities. And we will um, look at, sorry, my mouse here. We got to look at um, how antibodies and the cells that are involved as a, a conjunction between hypersensitivities and, aller, um, uh, and uh, parasite response.